Today I am joined by a legendary poster, uh, a connoisseur of revisionist history, a cultured thug, capitalization aficionado, and author of Steelstorm, Thomas777. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very glad to have you on. Um, I have a whole list of questions based on things you've talked about in the past and uh, even questions sourced from from your many fans because I, I let people know that you're coming on and they're very obviously have curiosities about uh, about you. Um, but I feel like history is at our doorstep and uh, it's especially at my doorstep because I'm in Romania right now. Um, so I feel like starting with uh, Ukraine and your uh, your reading of the situation is probably the most fitting thing to do. Um, I have to admit, being someone who's here, a lot of people ask me about my opinion. Okay, so what's your geopolitical assessment about what's going on? To be honest, I'm just a bit apprehensive to say. Uh, I feel like the narrative is ramping up in, in, in surprising ways. Um, I don't really have an assessment. If you asked me two weeks ago if this is going to happen, I'd probably have said, no way. Uh, I was wrong. You know, it, it happened. So um, I wonder, what is, is there a historical precedent? I mean, you're a learned man. Uh, how should one look at the situation right now? Well, as I indicated on my platforms right when the Russian assault commenced, I did not view this as surprising, okay? I'm not suggesting that I, I've got any sort of augurs instinct. But the fact of the matter is, in contrast to the way the man is presented in Western media, I mean, he's made into a caricature, as are all uh, heads of state, particularly ones that raise the ire of America and, and its its client regimes. But Vladimir Putin, uh, for a Russian executive particularly, but just objectively, it, for, for any head of state, he's remarkably conciliatory and he fancies himself as quite a politician. And I think that that's not off base in the in terms of the man's self perception. I have been surprised really since uh, 2008, and especially since 2014, that the Russians have been so tolerant of NATO's aggressive posturing with regards to their declared intent to utilize Ukraine as a, a basing hub for uh, all manner of, of weapon systems. And the people forget. I mean, I've made the point a lot that. You know, I, I think that there's a hollowness to any kind of rhetoric or revolving around NATO because international law, the, it, it's, it's only force is, is the, is the broken sense of parties to the treaty and the willingness to execute its remedies, as stated. I, I cannot foresee any scenario where the United States, Germany, um, and those are the only two states that really matter in, in NATO, um, I cannot see uh, any, any scenario where the United States, with Germany's blessing and, and operational participation, is going to wage a general war with Russia on the Russian border in order to, you know, guarantee Ukrainian sovereignty or in order to carve out Ukraine as some sort of basing hub for a NATO forward deployment. Um, that's just inconceivable that uh, such steps would be taken by Washington, even even that deranged regime that's been in place there since the end of the Cold War. So the Russians know this because it's obvious. You know, the fact is, in the absence of any actual alternatives, the United States is going to tolerate whatever Russia does on its own frontier because there is no other, uh, there, there is no available remedy other than tolerating it. Um, you know, the Washington can saber rattle all it wants. It can declare that it's seizing Russian assets. It can declare that you know, this is some sort of criminal act, but none of this matters because it's it's performative, where the where the rubber meets the road. And uh, in in power politics, all that matters is the ability to execute remedies in a, a way that is you know uh, forceful and, and and compromising. And the United States is neither willing nor capable of doing that. So I, I wasn't surprised by it. Like I said, my my uh, the timing surprised me somewhat, but even that. As I stated before, um, I believe that the military situation in Ukraine was deteriorating to the point that the Russian general staff, or whatever its equivalent is, I, I don't know a lot about the Russian Federation's armed forces and how it's organized, um, but whatever the, whatever the control group is, the Russian army, you know, the, they were calling it the Joint Chiefs or the, or the general staff, I strongly speculate that they gave Mr. Putin a sort of ultimatum and uh, demanding that he act or step aside, uh, despite what 
it's, it's claimed by, by Western media and by his enemies. Mr. Putin is not some absolute authority. He's, he's very, very accountable to, to other people within uh, the Russian regime. And the Russian defense ministry wields extraordinary power. We would, would be alien to an American or, or an Englishman or even a, a German or a Frenchman. It's, 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 an, entrenched, uh, it's an entrenched feature of the, of the system there that is uh, a holdover from Soviet days, but is owing to geostrategic considerations and challenges that the Russians face as a state, as a people. That would always be the case. Um, but that's, uh, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex topic. The causes aren't complex, but some of the nuances therein are. So that's that's the most I could state my perspective. Uh, absolutely, I think my my um, reticence to believe it, um, my apprehension at uh, yeah the, the situation is just because I feel like a lot of people have been lulled into um, into a comfortable position, thinking that this type of power politics. Uh, will not happen in Europe again. Um, and essentially it's, it's kind of the Turkey fallacy or, uh, you know, Nassim Taleb's Turkey fallacy that, you know, the Turkey feels it's, uh, it's going to have a, you know, all of its, all the data that the Turkey has until Thanksgiving is that things are good. People are feeding me. They pet me. I'm, I'm having a good time. It, all, all, all my data points into the direction that tomorrow is going to be a good day. Uh, so the return of this type of, um, I don't know, a strong man, a directed power uh, is just very surprising. And that's, that's, you know, I probably fell, fell prey to that fallacy where I was like, yeah, this type of stuff doesn't, doesn't happen. Obviously it doesn't happen to me because I live here. It wouldn't, would never happen in this area ever again. Um, so I think there's, um, there's quite a bit of movement in that direction. And, and do you think that uh, this ties into the failure of the U S and Afghanistan? Was that maybe the triggering event uh, that, uh, set off Putin to think that this is possible. I think that yeah, I think it, I, I think it definitely was a contributing factor. Um, when I say it, I mean the deterioration of American credibility and the real moment at which America's credibility kind of collapsed. I mean, in a value neutral way, just uh, in terms of its ability to execute military operations of a sort that can act as a deterrent to rival powers. You know, when uh, Obama, you know, was making uh, overtures. Uh, in Congress, suggesting that he intended, you know, some kind of to, to launch some kind of assault on Syria, which obviously would have been totally unprovoked and and without any meaningful uh, strategic or political goal in mind. Uh, but nevertheless, the point is that I believe he was. I, I I don't just believe. I know that he was he was trying to shore up some kind of consensus and see if the political will was there to wage war on Syria. And uh, Putin very quickly drew a line in the sand and said, "This is not going to happen." And, uh, you know, Putin went uh, further and said, if, you know, the cause of Spelly that's being alleged Mr. Obama is that you know, Syria is, is hoarding weapons of mass destruction. First of all, how does that constitute some kind of rationalization or justification to invade a sovereign state? You know, one thing has nothing to do with the other. But secondly, you know, Putin said, if this is the, uh, if, if, if this is the rationale and if, if this is one of the United States' demands, you know, well, there, the, the remedy for that would be, you know, international oversight, including the Russian Federation, you know, which has complex interdependence with Syria, one of a few states outside of Belarus and Kazakhstan and Ukraine itself, frankly, that Russia has, has managed to sustain complex interdependence with in enduring capacity. And Obama was left with no, no freedom of action because not, not only was the hollowness he was policy exposed, but it's, it's moral bankruptcy as well as its flagrant irrationality was exposed. I think that's the point at which I, I think America's America's credibility, not just its its moral cachet, but also its uh its ability to deter other states through implied or explicit threats of military assault has been deteriorating really for twenty years. I, th I think the entire twenty first century there's been a, a, a precipitous decline in US credibility just in a broad spectrum sort of way. You know, political, military, all kinds of ways. But if there was a punctuated moment that really, really kind of compromised America's uh, ability to act decisively in strategic terms, it was uh, Putin slapping down the designs on Syria. I mean, when I say Obama, I don't mean the man himself. I don't think Obama was a particularly strong executive. But 
you know, as a matter of constitutional law, authority to go to war did and does lie with the president, and he was the man in the Oval Office. I'm sure that's clear to you and the listeners. But to bring it back, uh, forgive the tangent, I think even if there was a stronger U.S. executive in the Oval Office, you know, and not this kind of fool with no real mandate like Biden, I think the Russians would have acted anyway because I don't think they could afford to continue to wait. Um, like I said, I, I don't speak Russian, um, nor do I speak Ukrainian. And I don't have any sources on the ground to feed me direct testimony or, uh, you know, uh, live data on what's actually happening there. But it was clear, well, we get pieced together from all sources, Russian sources, British, American, uh, French, German, um, you know, uh, sources like Iranian press TV, which honestly doesn't have any, I'm, I'm not saying there was a credible source because they're not, but they, they, they certainly don't have reason to lie about this. Um, they don't really have a dog in the fight. You know, but it, it was clear that the military situation was deteriorating rapidly. And, uh, yeah, the political situation hasn't changed really in the last eight, nine years, but the military situation certainly has. And the, the Russians could not wait for uh, some kind of general state of, of ethnic warfare to break out across the entire country. And there are enough pretexts that would emerge for either the United States or more insidiously NATO to deploy on the ground under the auspices of peacekeeping when in reality, you know, this this was a nothing more than a, a pretext for deploying hostile forces on the ground, you know, literally miles from the Russian capital. Um I I think that's I I, I think that I, I think I don't think it's just because the Biden administration is 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 a sort of a fiction in terms of its mandate. Yeah, there was recently, um a few days ago I think even uh, an interview um of the Hungarian president, Viktor Orban. Um, I don't know if you caught that, but he mentions the um, the, the difference that he expects because he essentially describes the, he calls it like, the, the Anglo-Saxon order that we, that they've, uh, you know, they, they know how that works in the sense that, you know, the Anglo-Saxon hegemony asks of you to also um, adopt its morality as common sense. So you have to subject yourself to to its morality. Uh, and then he, he was describing the fact that, okay, we're expecting China to become the new hegemon uh, and at least China doesn't expect you to bow to its morality. Um, I thought that was that was interesting uh, because in, in in simple terms that that I feel like strikes a chord. I thought that was yeah that was relevant. Uh, how do you see that difference between you know Anglo-Saxon rule and and the, the coming Chinese rule? And will it be as benevolent as Orban thinks, or will there be a, a moral uh, you know subjugation as well from there? I think Orban's correct in the sense that one of the things that really really hurt. I mean. Uh, what, what, what really killed the globalist enterprise was when the concord that was supposed to emerge between the United States and the then Soviet Union um, fell apart. A lot of that had to do with the Bosnian War and Helmut Kohl, who uh, I think is something of an unsung statesman, and he was as much of a patriot as a, a German who served the Boom's Republic could have been. Um, his immediate recognition of the United State of Croatia really monkey-wrenched uh, the ability of uh, the Soviet Union, which was still in, in existence then in the United States, to see through this concord. I don't want to go too far afield, but it, George Herbert Walker Bush and Gorbachev, uh, a big part of their ambition was to keep the Soviet Union intact as a legal and political order until full disarmament, particularly strategic nuclear, but a general conventional weapons disarmament of the Soviet Union in the former Warsaw Pact was what was in the cards. And some sort of uh, global administrative apparatus continue to lord over what had been the Soviet Empire in a direct capacity. Um, there would have had to be some kind of devolved ruling apparatus in the several provinces or all blasts or whatever sort of structure endured. But that was really the only hope uh, to sustain uh, globalism. When it fell apart, it fell apart because of strategic considerations you know, and localism and, and resurgent nationalism that had been crushed by the Soviet empire and its police state juggernaut. But part of it also was that men like Orban himself, you know, who was a uh, an anti-communist partisan for his entire adult life, realized that the social engineering that is implemented by, you know, the United States and the European Union, owing to the uh, strictures, moral and political, that were established at Nuremberg, is really quite a bit more insidious than the Marxist-Leninist kind of garrison regime 
as a post in Eastern Europe. I'm not minimizing the suffering people endured under communism. It was abominable. But the uh, it, was, it had far less of an ability to insinuate itself into the culture and alter people's patterns of life in a catastrophic way. So Orban's absolutely right about that. Um, collaborating with the United States, with NATO, with the United Kingdom, which is really nothing more than, you know, a, uh, a United States client that sustains some supervisional trappings of sovereignty. The participant regime is, is a form of national and racial suicide. There's absolutely no reason why anybody should be inclined to do that unless, you know, they represent a, a minority within the country in question that, that is hostile to the, the majority culture. Um, so Orban's correct. He's incorrect. This idea that China is this is this is the new Soviet Union or is this you know kind of a America on steroids, waiting in the wings in power political terms? I find that absurd. China really is still a backwards place culturally and materially. It's demonstrated a tremendous knack for imitation of uh, Western productive techniques and uh, the mastery of certain technologies, mainly military, but. You know, some with general application. You know, people conveniently forget, or they just don't know. The Soviets and the Chinese, in geopolitical terms, they really had the planet, and there would have been very little that the United States and NATO would have done if Beijing and Moscow had simply found a way to cooperate. They couldn't do that because Mao would not let it happen. Because Mao at base was a provincial buffoon on the order of Idi Amin. He just happened to lord over a billion people and ultimately developed a strategic nuclear capability. But if the Chinese are going to make this big push for, for to be a world power, you know, they would have done it in 1964 instead of sabotaging themselves and then proceeding to kind of withdraw inward and, and become this kind of cult, uh, client state of America writ large. I realize that nature abhors a vacuum and no more is that more apparent than in the power that in political systems and in the power uh, paradigms that political systems participate in, but uh, I, I I don't understand what exactly the Chinese are waiting for. If 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 Mr. Orban is correct, you know they they lack the fortitude or the or the foresight or the uh, or the intelligence. I mean, in cultural terms, to assert themselves on the world stage as the Soviet Union did in the 1960s, but now they're going to do it. You know, when it's no longer, you know, half a century in, you know, in 20, 30 years, half a century into America's victory in the Cold War, it doesn't really make any sense. There will be something that fills that void, okay, um, in the, uh, as America continues to deteriorate and as there no longer is a unipolar world, either in, in power political and military terms or in economic and, and, and cultural terms, but it will not, it will not be some Chinese superpower that you know, has, has conquered the planet in some sort of dystopian uh, science fiction novel sort of way. That's my view of it. Yeah, I, I feel that, that that's correct. Just just also um, on the basis of, of how uh, power is exercised um, for, for the hegemon America at the moment, uh, it's it's the internet and it's everywhere. And it's, you know, piping in hot the the uh, the culture, the the zeitgeist, the all all of this, um, all of this, I don't know, whatever, liberalism, neoliberalism, whatever it is that, that we're living under from the US. And it's anyone who has one of these is is getting it um so i i wonder what what you think in terms of the just the the, the substrate is is this changeable i mean i don't think anyone's ever going to change the 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 current language so we speak english everyone speaks english anyone who uh strives to be uh high status will speak english uh they're not speaking mandarin they tried that i mean uh, my husband's from new zealand they tried you know to teach them chinese because they were waiting for for han han global dominance even like 20 years ago when he was in in grade school but it hasn't happened he's forgotten his mandarin in the meantime uh is there is there a way to to displace this this just networked situation that we're in uh, I feel that that's probably the heaviest um, 
challenge for for China. Like it's, even even if China brings in like a new flavor of C pop or whatever cultural uh, products they're trying to introduce, they're just not uh, skilled at that. They're they're not uh, they're not narratively. Uh, sophisticated, because you you also see these propaganda things on Twitter. Um, I don't know Chinese state media trying to make memes, and they're all just complete cringe. And there's no sophistication at all there. So, um, do you see that as a, as a big factor in in the continuation of the uh, the uh, GAE, the Globalist American Empire? Yeah, that's part of it. Um, I mean, I I don't think China's failure is going to prolong. Uh, the American Empire's lifespan in any way, but it, it's going to it, it, it's going to figure into what replaces it. You know, people forget. I mean, maybe you don't because you're you know from Eastern Europe and you're situated there now. You know, you the Soviet Union culture had real cachet for a time. You know, from the thirties to the seventies. I mean, from the thirties to the seventies, really, particularly in the third world. You know, and that's why. I mean, you you still to this day. I mean. You run across, you know, guys and girls my age from places like Mexico, from places like Nicaragua, from Sub-Saharan Africa, running around with Russian memes. Okay, I mean, that's, there's a reason for that. I mean, it was because Russia, it never had the kind of cachet America did, but it did have some kind of cachet. It's presenting an actual alternative system that was discreet and insular and had its own features. It was different from what the American, uh, European Union, which was in the European community, but you know the EC, not the EU, but it, it was it, it really was some kind of alternative modality. Like what China's doing is it's taking basically you know the white man's technology, taking his preferences, it's taking his aesthetics, it's taking his popular culture, it's taking his consumer goods, and it's just imitating them and stamping "Made in China" on it, figuratively and literally. I mean, there, there's nothing there; it's hollow. Um. So yeah, I I I agree with you. Um, my point about America is that it's. It, it's going to die a death by a thousand cuts. America's, I mean, I compare America to the late Soviet Union a lot because in power political terms, there are certain parallels, but there's, there's not going to be some some November 9th moment in America where things just fall apart or where uh, there's people marching on Washington and, and, and some fool like Biden or, or some or some FBI director or some general is desperately trying to keep the system together. That's not going to happen. You're just going to see more and more obsolescent structures you know, like where I live, you know, like like hugely scaled cities that once were these production loci, you know, increasingly kind of falling apart, you know, with this kind of bizarre and leadership, you know, where increasingly they just are not going to be able to attract capital in any way. At the local level, they're going to find more and more systemic and structural failures. But, I mean, America's going to lurch on probably for another 100 years. And it, ultimately, it's probably going to be a glorified Brazil or something. And you're always going to have... You know, there's, there's, there's always going to be some technology-driven innovation here, even if it's only, you know, derived from a pocket of, you know, highly capable, you know, high IQ people or whatever. But the world power is, is going to die a death from a thousand cuts. Like, what will replace it is probably going to be, I mean, I think, and I don't want to go too far afield or off point for, for our topic, and I realize we don't have all morning or afternoon, but one of the reasons NATO is obsolescent is it's not just in command and control ways and you know, the fact that it, it, there, there's a hollowness as regards the willingness of the signatories to apply the remedies as stated in the charter is that Europe is really a political pride. You know, Central Asia is really kind of the future of power political military competition. The major players are the Russian Federation, China, Kazakhstan, Turkey, to a lesser degree, Iran, you know, and Pakistan, India, to a lesser degree also. But that's you know, you're going you're to see various constellations of states, you know, in 100, 150, 200 years, you know, aggressively and violently vying for what remains of the, the natural bounty, and, you know, increasing population um, and technological pressures uh, deplete, you know, what remains. And I'm, I'm not some environmentalist kind of hype. I don't want people to derive that idea. But, you know, this, this is, this is going to become a real issue. And then moving forward, you're going to see a constellation of states. Uh, that probably is going to be somewhat floating and, and not really fixed in, to dominate these key regions. I mean, we're talking far in the future now, but that really is kind of what I, I see developing. And, you know, there, there's going to be something of a of, uh, of power in military terms. And uh, attendant to that is going to be the ability to kind of manipulate political occurrences 
with an immediate sphere of influence in these competitor states. I mean, that's, I realize I just gave you a lot that cue on there, but that's, that's what I see happening. I don't see some singular empire uh, or some singular superpower that becomes like the new Soviet Union replacing the United States, whether it's China or, or, or some other, you know, constellation of states or power. Um, and this death by a thousand cuts, um, what, who done it? You know, <laughs> what, what was it that, uh, that brought us to this point? Cause I essentially, one of the points of, of this podcast and what, what I'm interested in mostly is, um, kind of this, this the post-liberal moment. Uh, a lot of people who come on here essentially, you know, like to uh, dissect liberalism and blame it for the the collapse of the West. Uh, was it liberalism in your perspective, or what? What is the who's the culprit uh, for this uh, for this decline? It was a combination of factors. I mean, there was definitely massive subversion of uh, of the United States in the corridors of power. The Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. You know, Roosevelt was quite literally president for life, okay? I mean, he he served uh, 12 years. He was in the midst of his fourth term when he dropped dead. I mean, he would have, Franklin Roosevelt would have been president until the day he died. If that was 20 years, it would have been 20 years. Uh, the New Deal was truly a revolution. It was, it was as much a revolution as Adolf Hitler's revolution was uh, in 1933. It was as much a revolution as the Bolshevik Revolution was, you know, between 1917 and 1921, and in an enduring capacity, you know, until, uh, frankly, I believe, until Mr. Stalin died in 1953. So that really can't be overstated. You know, it's not as if America just, you know, business as usual is underway, and then, you know, there was these kinds of uh, secret intrigues that just changed things. The paradigm emerged under Roosevelt. It was, uh, it, it was, it was, it was pro-socialist. It was pro-communist in a basic sense. It abided a, a dialectical materialist view of history, even if it didn't favor some kind of Leninist paradigm for America. It was absolutely shot through with Jewish radicals. That's not some sort of uh, race baiting. I mean, this is indisputable. So there, there was a massively Zionist kind of outsider's view of the country and a, and a punitive sort of hostility to the majority culture. And the ambition was, uh, and one of the reasons why the New Dealers aim to annihilate Europe and wage a genocidal war against Germany and Europe was they wanted to create a world society. And the way you create a world society is you break down people's natural uh, concepts of authority, their, their, their natural kind of organic spontaneous preferences of, of how they wish to live, you know, their kind of symbolic psychological orientation of, 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 of how they structure their, their own values within their own, you know, and uh, people resist this very, very aggressively. So the way this was accomplished was through a combination of ethnic cleansing, um, you know, out and out punitive uh, abuse, you know, by the police and by the the, the legal system, and uh, simply by uh, you know the the destruction of uh, of discrete ethnic communities under auspices of either urban blight or you know civil rights. You know, it was all these things, and ultimately that doesn't work. That doesn't work any more than, you know, the Soviet Union's notion that, you know, we've reached, uh, we've solved our nationalities problem by giving everybody their own oblast or, you know, by, uh, by creating things like hunger and, and people's need for shelter and clothing on their back. You know, you can't create a pointless society, you know, it's devoid of you know, spiritual capital, it's devoid of, you know, essential social capital where people are alienated in their own lives, you know, they work meaning jobs or they, you know don't have any kind of jobs at all, as was often the case in the Soviet Union, despite their claim there was no unemployment. You know, you can't, uh, you, you, you can't, you can't eradicate any sort of identification values outside of the immediate and the pragmatic, you know, and expect uh, that system to endure or expect people to sacrifice and labor for it or for people to view it as legitimate. And I mean, that's, that's what happened to America. That's why you know, I make the point again and again to people who, I, I don't like this terminology, but, you know, younger folks, when I'm turning into an old guy, so they, you know, you know, like I, a lot of guys I, and ladies I meet are younger than me, but they talk about blackpilling. Well, okay, you know what the ultimate blackpill is? Is they still throwing up their hands and saying, it's all done, you know, we're, you know the way things are today, it's just always going to be this way. You know, nobody actually believes in, in, quote, American values. Like they say they do. It's not, it's not considered acceptable to say that you don't. You know, if you're a company man or if you're some ambitious lady, you can't go around and talk about how much you don't like these things and expect to get ahead. But nobody actually believes in that. It's a punchline. You know, I mean, if uh, it's uh, America says, you know, everybody's equal, but, you know, 
we're going to lock a million black people in prison, you know, just because they're not behaving themselves. Or, you know, these uh, these aging white people who, you know, vote for Biden, you know, the, the minority that did vote for Biden, <laughs> you certainly didn't receive an electoral majority. You know, they claim that, you know, they post yard signs saying they hate racism, but, you know, they, they live in all white or all Jewish communities, at least where I'm at. You know, it's, I, I look at how people behave, not what they say. And if you look at how people behave, nobody actually believes in this. You know, any more than, any more than people in, you know, spring 1989 believed in, you know, the, the, the party in Germany. You know, I don't, I don't care what they said they did. You know, people say what they have to to get by. They have something of a rant, so forgive me, baby, but uh, you want to, that that's my view of it in a nutshell. Is that the sites that make it? That was too polemical. Forgive me, but I think sometimes polemic is in order. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I um, I'm I'm thinking. I mean, essentially, what you're describing here is a is an ideological project, but not of the common man, but of a certain type of elite. Um, do you think that that's something that replaced the vacuum of the death of religion? Does that play any part in this, or? Um, Because it does, you know, a lot of people make that association that it's essentially hollowed out the skin suit of Protestantism, um, you know, going off the rails and uh, and kind of replacing elite an elite belief system. Yeah, that's part of it. And I mean, politics is always conceptually theological. I mean, in the the 20th century, this developed kind of its own momentum in earnest because the 20th century was the reign of materialism. It really was. That's why things that's why it seems strange. You know, people, if you read. Uh, if you it, Lenin was actually a genius, he was a, he was a, he was a, he was a terrible man, and he was criminally minded. But he, like Mussolini, was, Mussolini was a great man. I'm not comparing them in terms of character, but what they have in common is they they really really understood revolutionary politics in a way that is rare. But you you'll read screeds by Lenin, like for example, imperialism, and it's brilliant. It's got great insights, but then he reverts this bizarre kind of theory of history, you know, about the laboring castes. And, you know, history is reducible, you know, to exploitation by capital and the appropriation of surplus. It's totally that's wrong, but nobody thinks that way. And then, like, I'll read Alfred Rosenberg, who had a hell of a lot more of a sense of, of human affairs than Lenin. But, you know, he'll start distilling down about, uh, you know, the Germans and the Slavs or the war because of biological imperatives. I mean, that doesn't really make any sense either. But in the 20th century, this is just the way people thought. You know, and, and you can't really get away from that. So... O- owing to tensions that gave rise to total war and the mobilization kind of of all uh, spheres of human endeavor. I mean, that put politics first and foremost in everybody's mind and existence. But also the 20th century, it was fertile ground to really kind of create, you know, a secular cult of, of politics, quite literally. That's just what people believed in in lieu of church. But even aside from those kind of de- those kind of peculiar circumstances, politics in all types of all places, I mean, this was Hobbes' great insight. Even if you don't accept anything else, Hobbes posited. You know, Thomas Hobbes made the point that, you know, in, in symbolic psychological terms, any man, any woman under any regime, no matter their cultural orientation, you know, they're, they're going to view authority in, in theological terms, okay? And they're going to view political authority in those same terms, you know, whether they view it as ordained by God, uh, whether they view it as deriving its authority from, you know, some kind of formal and ceremonial uh, conveyance of power, or whether they just, you know, subliminally or not, you know, view intervention in an executive capacity like one would a miraculous occurrence by a benevolent God. That's just the way humans are wired to conceptualize. So that's inevitable. Um, was this deliberately uh, contrived by elites in America? I mean, to some degree, it. Uh, I, I hear people talk about, particularly Catholic guys, and I'm not bashing Catholics. I got great love for Catholics. And traditional Catholics, they're essential to our people and, and, and our fortunes, okay? I'm very much a Protestant. So when people say that, like, oh, well, you know, racial egalitarianism and feminism, all these things come from Protestantism, all I got to say is that, you know, the guys who were standing in the of integrated schools saying they refused to allow it, these were Protestant guys. You know, the guys who constituted the 1920s Klan, who were, you know, rabid nativists, these guys were Protestants. It was not a bunch of church-going Protestants who were forcing integration on people. You know, it wasn't a bunch of Baptist ministers who were, uh, you know, hanging around the Rockefellers and uh, staffing the NAACP and, and forcing, uh, you know, Chicago parish communities to be integrated. You know, it was a bunch of crazy secularists and, uh, you know, out and out atheists. I mean, there's probably something you could be that could be said that in the modern state, if there's not a unitary church, 
you know, if there's, you know, a congregational structure, no matter how pious it is, you know, a place as diverse as America, you know, was um, when it was a country, I mean, majority white, okay, it's probably a lot easier to mobilize political elements against, you know, a thousand congregations than against a unitary church, like one would find, you know, among, among Catholic parishes. But it's really a, a strategic kind of practical matter. It, it doesn't tell us anything about, you know, the relationship of, of theology to politics. Um, I hope that wasn't too abstract. Um, that was as cogent as I could make it. It's an important topic and it's very complicated. Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a lot of people uh, imagine Protestantism as a kind of um, a religion a redux, you know, without the frills. And uh, the idea that Protestantism translates into politics is that you extract every frill and all of the religion and all you have is the egalitarianism. And that's how I think the the, the whole logic of oh, this is just Protestantism goes. At least that's how I've been, I've, I've seen it described by others. Yeah, I think that there's. I think that's the way they do conceptualize it. And some of them, I don't. I'm not saying that like a bunch of people are are bigoted towards people like me, but that's not the case at all. But I, I think there is a lack of understanding. I mean, I can go as far to say, and I mean, some people I'm sure are going to say that they're going to assign to me some kind of tendency towards apology for my own faith. But you know, the I the National Socialist heartland in Germany. I mean, Lutherans were different than people like me. I'm a Presbyterian, okay. But uh, the, the tendency towards Pietism, this reliance on the witness and the congregation over any sort of, you know, more formal authority. These are the people who became the hardline national socialists. You know, it was not urban Catholics and it was not guys like the Reichsführer SS, you know, who were going to lapse Catholics. It was hardline pietist Protestants. And uh, this idea that, you know, first and foremost, your loyalty is, you know, the congregation, you're kind of an immediate community. And uh, your your moral metric is the inner witness, like literally what your instincts tell you about what is right, you know, by way of reason. I, I don't need to extrapolate, I don't need to explicate elaborately, like, why that lends itself to, you know, racial awareness and things. I mean, that's my view of it. I don't think people should look at faith, religious faith as some kind of pragmatic, you know, uh, tools in order to implement and achieve political goals. But such that there is an interplay between the fortunes of white Christian peoples and uh, their faith orientation or community, I mean, that's that would be the way that I characterize it. And I'm certainly not afraid to criticize my own tradition. I've got a lot of problems with the way most mainstream Protestants do things, conduct themselves, and uh, and hold themselves out to others. Okay, I mean, I, I'm certainly not gonna. I'm not some guy who is afraid to air out his own culture as dirty laundry. So I don't want that to be misunderstood. Also, but yeah, it's an important topic, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I believe you're correct. That that's the way people view it. But I would behoove them to dive deeper into such matters and, and develop a more kind of coherent and accurate picture. Yeah, I think I think one of the main factors in this is scale. And I think that scale is one thing that, you know, with, with globalization, with kind of like supranational organization, the NGO industrial complex, like all of these things that have just span the globe and, you know, in, in a way, you know, the difference between kind of Catholicism centralized in Rome and, and Protestantism is kind of this centralized versus decentralized difference. Um, you see a lot of people trying to revert back to localism now. And I feel like that this is kind of one of the moves to get away from the from the many tentacles of, you know, eldritch disasters that 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 haunt the world now and in, in the forms of, you know, ex-union and Ex supranational system. Um, do you see that as as a possibility, like de decentralization? You know, cutting down on scale. You know, going back to just being in meat space with the people around you. Uh, is that a solution, or is that just a pipe dream? No, it's a solution. That's what I spend my time doing. I mean, yeah, I realize I I write a lot of content and stuff, and I and that's what I spend most of my time doing. You know, things like this. Um, and I, I'm very, very grateful to be in demand, you know, by yourself and by a lot of these other content creators. I mean, I, I'm not being polite. That's a real honor. I don't, it really is. It's great. But all the stuff that I do and we do, it's really secondary to building, rebuilding social capital. I mean, that's what I, that's my whole jive. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm always telling people that, you know, to go off their ass and come see me. And when I go around the country, which I do a lot, you know, I'm always telling people, like, here's where I'm going to go. You know, let me know if we can cross paths. And, you know, I, it, it's not just because, like, I want people to, you know, knock back a scotch with and, you know, be able to, like, sleep for free in lieu of pay for a hotel room. I mean, those things are nice, too, but the fact is, I'm all the people together in my own little orbit, 
you know, coast to coast, you don't know each other. And if I land, if I land on the ground there, or if they land on the ground here, or any of these people like brought together, you know, we've created a real network. Okay, like nascent as it might be, it's not nearly as nascent as people might think. And uh, just what we're doing here, we're having a real discussion about real issues affecting our race. You know, we we've got different backgrounds. Our sectarian orientation is different, but there's common denominators here. And you know, just the fact that this conversation this would have been unthinkable in a lot of ways 20 years ago. I would have been on Usenet, and you and I would have been talking with like nine other guys, and frankly, probably almost all of them would have been guys, and that would have been it. And that's I mean, that was that was dope for its time. I mean, I made some great lifelong friends there, but that's not something upon which you could build an alternative, uh, you know, communitarian structure. But I mean, that's what we are doing. Um, the theoretical stuff and the abstract stuff that I deal in, that's kind of more to help people understand, you know, why this became necessary. You know, but it's um, like you and your husband are are doing a lot more for our people and, <laughs> than I'm doing. I mean, you're having children and you're <laughs> you're literally. I, I, I'm not being funny. You're or, you're just polite. You're you, you really are creating the uh, guaranteeing the linear generational survival of our people. I mean, that that at the end of the day, that's what this is about. You know, I'm like, I'm just, I'm a weird guy who like you know writes content that people like, and I I would hope and people tell me I am you know making things a little more accessible conceptually. And that's, I think that's kind of my role on earth. But, you know, like I said, people like yourself, people are raising families. I mean, they're crazy as it sounds. That that's about the most revolutionary thing one can do these days. The significance of that cannot be overstated. You know, I mean, guys, when you come and go, uh, you know, bringing life into the world that bears our uh, our, our our culture is, is quite literally doing God's work. I mean, to get all that heavy, but um, no, the... Uh, that's the only way out of this. People who think that there's some sort of a uh, that, that, that there's some sort of way to decapitate the regime and replace it with something friendly, I mean, they don't really get that we're we're under a failing system. It's not just that the wrong people are at the helm of it. I mean, that's certainly that's a huge part of the problem. But structurally, it's structured because it is structured to accomplish the goals it's out to accomplish. It's not this value neutral thing, and it's not this sustainable thing. You know, world societies don't work. Like continent sized bureaucracies don't work. Or are they desirable? You know, it's not enjoyable or for the people that are under them. It's not like some kind of great human potential is being realized by this. So I mean that it's wrong headed for a lot of ways. But also even what wasn't, I mean, what do people want to do? What do they I mean, I what, what would that even entail? Would it entail, you know, going some Turner Diaries kind of scenario? I don't want to get too explicit because I don't want people to think I have crazy ideas or that if you know they vote for Donald Trump enough that everything's gonna change. Like I I'm not trying to be obtuse or or be be mean to people or something, but it's not even clear to me what exactly they think, you know, what revolutionary action would entail of, of a direct, uh, of, of a directly medial nature. No, I mean, it's, it's all about social capital and doing exactly what I am doing and what you are doing and you know, what all the people who are with us and, uh, a spiritual as well as, you know, more kind of day-to-day sense of doing. Yeah, it's it's a surprisingly spiritual endeavor because of something I, I often talk about on this podcast is how the the world that we live in now, you know, for for people from from all over the world is just not equipped for um for for procreation. Like I I met my husband. We I used to work in London. That's where we met. You know, that city is 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 made to extract labor from you and to entertain you in your you know four hours of spare time in the afternoons to get you drunk every night of the week, and then you can go to a fancy museum or whatever exorbitant restaurant on the weekend and that's that's your allotted a lot in life and that's what you should do uh, it's not it's not made for children it's not incentivized children is, are something that kind of take away from what you you should be doing you know it's it's a luxury it really is you know something that you do if you have excess amount of time excess amounts of money that you can just like lavishly spend into this this crazy insane direction that uh, you you know why, why should you uh, it also uh, uh, distances you from your friends. You know, you have to change friend groups completely because most people you work with are probably not interested in procreation that much. They're interested in, in keeping on the, the the hamster wheel. Uh, so it's it really is almost almost a spiritual act where you you know obviously the, on the one hand you have the the biological imperative where you you know as especially as a woman you really feel the need to do this hopefully eventually at one point. Um, but there's also um, kind of a 
you really have to decide, I will rip myself from my current life and I will go into this new life. Uh, and you have to find someone who wants to do that as well, which is also not, not easy. So it is, it is really like a, almost like an act of spiritual war to do it. If you are on the girl bus track as I was, I'm sure there are other people who, you know, live in small towns and don't really have to do this whole Shogun <laughs> thing to, to, to transcend themselves. It, no, I, I was being entirely serious. And yeah, I mean, um, Women have to put up with a lot. I emphasize that to to the fellas. Um, women certainly aren't victims, and I I I I make a point. People really got to disabuse themselves of that idea. But you know, it's not. I mean, women, men and women have different kinds of problems, but women certainly do not have it easy because yeah, they're they're uh, um, they're subject to a social engineering regime that essentially uh, is a uh, is, is anti procreative. It's, it's a it's a culture of death, um, explicitly and implicitly. But at the same time, that's what I'm always trying to emphasize: the black pill types. I'm like, you know, look at who these are people who they think the highest oh, good is you know promiscuous sex. They made they made a sacrament of sodomy. They abort their own kids. They don't, you know, they 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 live these kind of discreet lives where they of you know kind of within the self completely. It's that, that revolves on the satiation of irrational desires and lustful passions like this, this can't perpetuate itself. I, I mean, they're, they're, they're quite literally committing suicide, not, not just historically and in apocalyptic terms, but I mean, physically, the, the minority of people who actually believe in the kind of things that Mr. Biden says, these people don't have children. You know, are you nuts? They're doing exactly what you said. They're, you know, they're working, they're working some shitty office job, you know, with, 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 uh, material desires in their mind, you know, they're, you know they're cruising bars and clubs and just kind of having sex with strangers. You know if 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 one of if the if the ladies among them get pregnant, you know they abort the kid as soon as they as soon as they um become aware of uh of the situation. How exactly are these people in going to win? I mean that's something it's very easy to lose sight of. You know I mean it um the future doesn't the the future can't belong to uh you know aging people who kill their own children. That's not how things work. You know I mean, I'm not trying to be flippant about, you know, something that's profoundly serious, but I, you know, the, uh, I don't think my perspective is skewed. The only, the only people I see like having real families are people like you, white people who actually have, you know, a a historical and, and, and faith based orientation towards their lives. And, you know, people like, you know, people from, from the far East or people in the middle East, you know, who've just kind of rejected Western values or what was held out as Western values and do their own thing within their own, you know, deliberately insular communities. It's not their fascinated white losers or having kids. It's not, you know, people who believe in the regime. It's, uh, I mean, they're a minority anyway, but again, they're not, if within a generation, there'll be none of them left. I mean, that's, you know, the problem is going to take care of itself. I mean, we've got a lot more, there'd be a spiritual crisis among our race anyway, that is a question of, you know, defeating the enemy, but that is part of the equation. That a lot of that is going to take care of itself. You know, these people are going, they're, they're making themselves extinct. Yeah, I, I would be more kind of comforted by that thought if I didn't know how infectious the these ideas are. Like I see, you know, uh, th- this is always kind of a discussion, you know, between in, in the dating discourse and, you know, between men and women and stuff. I feel like a lot of men don't realize, and I sh- I'm sure a lot of men are also subject to these influences, but women are very malleable. They're very agreeable. They tend to absorb these memes uh, in very readily, especially things that promise, you know, high status, you know, because for example, if you're whatever, 20 something woman nowadays, uh, the way to win in society is to go down these paths, the way to acquire status, the way to acquire whatever, the things that people say, okay, you're doing well, you've, you've won at life are to, to pursue these paths. Um, and I feel like a lot of girls, especially, you know, girls who do well in school and, you know, who try, who try their best and who, you know, have not fallen off the path, uh, you know, the, the, the good girls, they go down these paths in a way and you'd think, oh, you know, just all of this promiscuity is only for like women who are mentally insane. Like I know a lot of women who have, you know, were just, you know, the best girls in school. They, this is the, this is the path that was laid out in front of them and they just walked it and it, it ends in a, in a dead end, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, 
they wouldn't have known it. No one was there to tell them. And I know a lot of these guys say, oh, their, their fathers told them. No, their fathers didn't tell them. Their fathers were boomers. You know, they had three marriages. They weren't, they weren't around. No one actually was sat them down and told them you should do X and you should do Y. They just went along with what was there. Um, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's weird to say that women have less agency than you think, but I think all people have less agency than you think, but women in particular sometimes. I mean, it's uh, women have a whole lot of pressure to conform upon them, and it has to be that way. It's not because women are less intelligent. I mean, I I think genius is basically a male trait, but on average, like women are probably smarter than men. I'm talking about the average, okay? The fact that there aren't really female geniuses doesn't change that. Like most men are fucking stupid, okay? I mean, anybody who's been in the world would not think women are dumb. Um, but there's pressures. If you're a single man like me, you know, as long as I'm not out in my twenties. Like, nobody really gives a shit what I do. Okay, that's good and that's bad. Okay, I mean, it's bad because it's indicative of a lack of social capital. It's good because I can pretty much do whatever I want within reason. Women do not have that luxury. If you're a woman, people are always in your business. Okay, that's number one. Number two, what you're dropping are facts, and they're facts that people got to confront head on because they're real. But at the same time, one of the way people tend to forget the reason that liberalism became infectious is that. It's because America had cachet, because Americans were better off than everybody on the planet, because America really was full of winners. Because, like, on TV, you'd see people like Eisenhower, you'd see people like Mr. Kennedy and his pretty wife, or you'd see these glamorous people in Hollywood who seemed normal. Or you'd see, like, a guy who was a factory foreman, but he had two cars, you know, and he had his own house in the suburbs, and he'd take his family on vacations, you know, twice a year. I mean, that's not the case anymore. Like, there's really not incentives. You know, Americans, they got crummy jobs. You know, they don't have any money. They got a big pile of debt. You know, American real wages going on 50 years have been stagnant. You know, I mean, Americans themselves, it's like, you walk in America City, it's a bunch of unhealthy, fat, ugly people. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not saying I'm so fucking great. I mean, I'm not going to win any beauty contests anytime soon. But you understand my point, okay? Like, it's not, this isn't 1969. Where it's like, okay, the rest of the developed world is like, looks like the Soviet Union. Or the place like Japan where, okay, you know, it's high tech. But it's sort of a nightmare of overpopulation and, you know, nobody has like any real personal liberty. And, you know, you're still dealing kind of with the aftermath of this apocalyptic war. You know, most of, most of the developed world is frankly better off in America. I, I guarantee you, Pete, bad as things are because it's occupied and it's been subjected to a horrible social engineering regime. I mean, you people in Berlin, like your average John and Jane Q public, are a lot more healthy and well-adjusted, and you've got real wealth day-to-day than your average American. I mean, or somebody in Korea, like, we would also be American. It's, it's, Americans are losers, you know? I mean, I, so I think that's part of it. Um, with respect to women being malleable, again, like I said, there's pressures on females, there's not on men. I mean, men have to deal with other shit uh, that I think is just as, uh, that weighs just as heavily, but it's of a different character. Um, as these kinds of things lose cachet, and as they become sort of hollowed out by the fact that they, it's become clear that there's not really any any, any value conferred upon the person, either of a material, pragmatic tough sort, or of a spiritual, social sort, you know, women are just going to be like, they're, they're not going to follow what amounts to a hollowed out paradigm anymore, because nobody actually believes in that. You know, um, and I, I really think that's starting to happen. I, most of the people I'm around, I, I don't really hang around a lot of people my own age. Um, most of the people I hang around with are quite a bit older than me or younger than me. And I'm around young guys and girls a fair amount, which is dope. I mean, that's great. And it's one of the reasons I think by just being a I actually have energy to get shit done. Maybe it's a self-selecting sample because these are boys and girls who, who have some kind of sense of identity uh, of their race and you know, who generally have a pretty strong faith background, whatever Christian sect, but they don't, and obviously they're not telling, you know, me, like, what their personal business is, but they don't seem like people are sleeping around and, and buying into kind of the regime mythologies. I mean, they, they just don't. And again, like I said, the kids who seek me out because they, you know, agree with the things I have to say, but I, I, 10 years ago, that wasn't happening. I mean, I, you know, 20 years ago, which sure as hell wasn't happening. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's all I can say from my view on the ground. 
Yeah, I, I, that's another question I wanted to ask you because uh, a lot of people who um, have kind of been in, in the shadow corners of the internet are now gaining some some relatively mainstream clout. Uh, you know, Curtis Yarvin's been on Tucker. He's been on Alex Jones. You know, I don't know if that's necessarily mainstream. It's mainstream on our side. It's as mainstream as it gets. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, there's just quite a break. And how have you felt this this change from, you know, you were like this, uh, you know, legendary poster, kind of a, a man of mystery. And now you have a relatively public persona. You come on, you know, shows like mine, uh, discussing the events of the day. Uh, you are a, kind of a pundit now. So how have you felt this this change? Something many, many years ago, I'm talking like late 1990s, I talked to these guys who were the age I am now back then, you know, Vietnam warrior guys. And uh, something they were always emphasizing and something I internalized. I mean, I, I was always very much a right Hegelian. I was at an apocalyptic view of history. But I knew that at some point, it may or may not be in my lifetime that I see it develop. But I knew even 20, 30 years ago that the system can't just endure perpetually for the reason we've been talking about. You know, because its frailties will be exposed, because it'll start failing in data terms. It'll no longer have, not just, it'll no longer have cachet, but also it'll no longer have relevance in historical terms that won't make sense anymore. You know, like, just as, the, just as Marx's Leninism, aside from its, its injustices and the brutality of it, it just stopped having a context. You know, peop, the, the modalities of people's lives no longer were what they were in the 19-teens, you know, so by the 1980s, you know, talking about a worker state, like, like who are the workers anymore? You know, it's, it's an imperfect analogy, but I talked to these older men, and they were almost all men, again, like I said. They used to emphasize it a lot. Like, look, when you're my age, things are not going to be like they are now. I mean, I knew that intuitively anyway, but so when we started blowing up, like, my brand really started blowing up right around 2016. And then in earnest, like, around 2017, 2018, uh, that surprised me that it didn't... Um, I was kind of surprised how rapidly people took on, uh, in relative terms, a right wing identity. <laughs> Trump's ascendancy owes to, or owed to. And Trump's not a particularly right wing guy in, in real terms. But you know, like I like I said before, you know, what your constituency identifies you as, that's kind of what you are. Okay, for better or worse, Americans in the American context, and that's a very imperfect and flawed paradigm. They view Donald Trump as this right wing populist figure. Okay, so. The fact that this, you know, 10 million, literally, you know, 70 or 80 million uh, white silent majority types, you know, rallied around about this protest identity that really is explicitly uh, based on, on revolt against, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a cult of war identity, okay? Um, I did not think it would be punctuated, um, but I knew that at some point, you know, the ideas that we were putting out there and my own content would find a wider audience, not because I'm so great or because my content is so dope, but because it deals in topics that people are to, uh, to consume, not, not in a flippant way, but, you know, to deal with and absorb that, you know, and I, I think uh, what I, I'm not, I don't think I'm being egoistic by saying that I, I'm, I'm fairly good at distilling down complex uh, paradigms and conceptual uh, uh, it matters in, into things that are understandable um, at a glance. Okay, uh, most people can't do that. I, I can. I mean, it's not only any great. Some people are great at painting pictures. Okay, that's what I am good at. So that's the reason why I started. Part of it was I was I, I viewed this as kind of a personal journey, not personal in terms of you know oh I want to better myself, but I wanted to understand the world around me. Um, and every day as I age, it's kind of really my life's work. Okay. I, I'm fine with being, you know, a single kind of monastic guy, but it's not like I'm looking after a family or something. And it's like, well, apparently this is what God wants to do. But be as it may, I wasn't just taught when I, back in those years, days I keep returning to, I wasn't just doing this to pass the time or cause, you know, I really like these 10 guys or a dozen people I was talking to. It's cause I said, okay, at some point it might be after I'm dead, but if people are going to rely on this in order to you know, wage the culture war. Um, and God forbid, but I think it may happen eventually, you know, the, an actual war against uh, the elements that several oppress us. But I, I wanted to do what I could to contribute to that, however small or nascent that might have been. So, yeah, I, 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 I knew at some point this moment would arrive. I, I did not think it would arrive when it did or in such a punctuated way. But um, I, 
I, I didn't see how, how I could just endure the, the historical conditions that were underway. I was born into, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely makes sense. Um, and and because you mentioned that you um, you hang out with a lot of younger people, and uh, you you've kind of um, yeah you've accumulated the wisdom of the ages, maybe maybe at a young age, and now you're ready to to propel it. One question from the audience is someone someone sent this uh, in. Do you have like one kind of piece of of rounded advice to someone who's like in their twenties or thirties uh, and is living at this you know precipice of history? Is there something that you'd like to communicate to people who look up to you? I mean, in practical terms, um, it's essential to not go into debt, and it's essential not to vest your in ambitions that require the regime to show you benevolence. When I say the regime, I just mean the government. I mean, there's several structures that kind of make up our world socially and in terms of our labors, okay? Um, I realize if you're a young father or something, it changes things. But, I mean, the best thing you can do is is not take out debt and build social capital because wealth is your ability to draw upon the the generosity and benevolence of others. I mean, you're going to give of yourself as well, obviously. That's that's what community is. That's an overused term, and forgive me, but I, I mean it in sincere, a sincere way, not in a tribe way. Don't avail yourself to the, don't allow yourself to become situated in life where, where you are dependent upon the benevolence of, of hostiles in order to survive and thrive. Individually, I mean, that means you're not, really a free man. I mean, no man is truly free in, in, in the modern age, but in a very, very kind of immediate way, you're, you're sort of availing yourself to a kind of bondage to do that. And you're also, I mean, it's, you're, you're really, you're doing a disservice to your race. Okay. I mean, you, you really are right? If, uh, if, if you're only, if your involvement in, in right-wing activities or dis- discussions or what have you is to blow off steam, but then, you know, you go back to being a company man who's, desperate to, you know, make equity partner at a lot. I, I really don't think you're serious about things. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not any better than the other man. We're all, every man and woman is, is, uh, you know, is my and, and identical absolute depravity, but it, you know, it, be honest with yourself, you know, be honest about your circumstances. And unless you have absolutely no choice, do not buy in as it were to the system. There's plenty of ways these days to make money, particularly for a smart, motivated young dude. Um, you know, it's, this is this is not 1970. You don't you don't you don't need to support some institution in order to get ahead. You really don't. I mean, that's that's the best I can do. Unless I misunderstood the question. No, no, you you, you understood the question, and I uh, I I really I really agree with this, and uh, that that's been my experience as well. I mean, I I've kind of lived in very very liberal circles, and was kind of a <laughs> always felt like some sort of. Uh, not even imposter, but just like a like an enemy agent behind the lines, and a very very strange. And you know, people started to cry when when Brexit happened, and I just I don't know, I just didn't know how to handle myself in those environments, you know, without without being completely <laughs> completely schizo. So yeah, I had to I had to escape, and it was worth it. Yeah, so I think that that's essentially my my diagnosis of it as well. I mean, you can put up with it for a while, um, but it really uh, consumes you. Uh, and like you said, there's so many ways of of, um, of making money nowadays. You can even, you know, whatever whatever it is, if it if it if it happens, you know, behind a, an internet connection, like you know, most jobs happen nowadays. There is there are ways to add a layer of anonymity to it, and you know, do your whatever uh, logo design or. I don't know, JavaScript coding from behind an anonymous uh, persona and it can be done. Uh, there's crypto, there's all sorts of things. So it, there's never been a better time to not put up with, uh, with shit from, from other people. Oh yeah, yeah. Very well stated. Yeah, so um, I think uh, there, there's another question here uh, because um, what, what I deal with in, in this podcast is essentially um, critiquing the marketplace of ideas uh, because a lot of people who come to this podcast come from places like the IDW, you know, uh, from kind of places like New Atheism, you know, where, where there's uh, a worship of, of rationalism, of positivism, of science, of, of truth, of facts versus feelings, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, and uh, a lot of these people think that, okay, if we could get to truth, if we could just, you know, just get back to positivism, um, all will be right in the world. Um, I wonder, do you think this this view is correct? Or if, if it's not correct, what, what's wrong with it? I mean, I'm a guy who deals in political theory and, and historicism. And there's this problem with uh, 
Well, I think I agree with E. Michael Jones about him, and I agree with him about a lot of things. As strange as that might sound, because I'm very much a Protestant kind of Peckerwood cracker dude, but um, I a, a lot of these uh, a lot of the, a lot of the a lot of the Catholic thinkers, you know, writing in response to the uh, to the excesses of the, of the Second Vatican Council uh, are guys I I think have a really great handle on diagnosing what's what what happened. Um, in the 20th century, and Jones is, is first among them. And uh, one of the insidious things about uh, the Enlightenment is this idea, and people on the right and the left, the right as well as the left, do this. You know, this idea that you know economics is a kind of science, and that if it's it, with, the, with the correct modeling and the correct inputs and the correct you know data awareness, you know, you, you just somehow model the, the, the correct paradigm of power. That that's that's ridiculous. And politics has to do with, first of all, it has to do with identity, it has to do with loyalty, it has to do with social capital, and quite literally, way of life, okay? It's it's not about distributed justice or about, you know, who gets XYZ or the distribution of, of some amorphous good that supposedly is the metric of equality. It's none of these things, okay? I made the point before that, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, Steve Jobs, or even Einstein, or I think it was something of a fraud. I guarantee you every one of those men was exponentially smarter in IQ set terms than Mohammed or Napoleon or Adolf Hitler. I also guarantee you not a single man is gonna lay down was gonna lay down his life for Steve Jobs. Okay, I mean it's not we're not we're not talking about a rational surprise. Okay, yes, there is a rational aspect to politics and the bounded rationality of power politics and warfare, but we're talking about things that uh partake of reason, will, and passion in, in varying proportions, you know, that, that we're, we're talking about the kind of the guts of, of, of what it means to be human and the essence of what human spheres of activity entail. Okay. And that's the way to understand politics. I can't even understand why I want to live under some, you know, positive ordering of politics. I mean, why that, that seems like some kind of nightmare, you know, I mean, it, uh, it, it's you know it, it reduces man to some kind of to some kind of machine organism. I I think. I mean I that that's my take on it. I mean if people think that way, if their whole view is that well the problem is that you know, we need to filter out the high IQ people and you know our only problem is that you know you know the Chinese and Jews are great because they have high IQs and you know we we got to get rid of all the stupid irrational stuff in politics. I mean what that the fuck is that? <laughs> that's like I, I don't know what that is, but it's not the way human beings think. At least not normal ones. Okay, and I mean it's certainly not. That's certainly not what motivates people to great deeds of a uh, of a political uh, nature. I mean, I that's 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 all I got. On it. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, um, a way of seeing the world that's very attractive to a type of person uh, who's been very successful in the last, you know, even century. You know, the type of person who is technically adept who, you know, um, can rotate shapes or whatever, uh, who uh, is uh, a master of technology and uh, sees the world from that perspective. You know, someone who thinks that if they can solve an equation or, you know, write a line of code that gets you from A to B, that ethics uh, gets subjugated to the same forces or that, you know, politics has rules just as a computer program and that we can just, if you could just implement the rules, there would be no conflict. We would just find the optimum solution to solve the human problems, whatever, wherever they may lie. Uh, and I feel like it's, it's yeah, it, there, there's a, definitely a, um, a domain specific blindness uh, for these people. What's the, what's the end game? It's like, okay, like, I mean, Francis Yaki made this point too. It's like, you know, the, 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 the railing cry of, of, the, of the progressive left of the 20th century is we're going to put an end to war. It's like, why? You know, it's like, so it's your, your utopia is a place where, you know, all material needs are provided for, there's no conflict, so you want to live in a giant nursing home? That's a pointless society. You know, like, that's what, that's, that's something a lot of these, po- I realize I'm making something like a caricature in the perspective, but, I mean, I, it, it's not, I'm not making some great leap of your logic to cast the view in punitive terms. It, like, what, what, what is the point of these kinds of societies where they were even possible? You know, I, I don't want to live in a pointless society. Nobody does. I and mean, it's not why um, government's not some end in itself. You know, the, the Enlightenment perspective is, is is colored by this kind of rationalism that doesn't really have, that doesn't really have a legitimate place of prominence in, in analyzing uh, 
foot structures, but it, it begs the question as to why this would even be desirable. You know, like a political system, it ex- it's either it's either guaranteeing the survival and posterity of a people, or it's not. We got to condition man to be more 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 malleable, so that you know this this marvelous government theory can be implemented. You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's uh, I I can't that that, that I, I can't overstate it enough. That's one of the reasons why I don't understand why. Well, as I cite uh, Joseph de Maestra a lot, is because uh, I, I'm not saying Edmund Burke was some was some ridiculous positivist. So the, there is, he still is colored by this kind of pointless pragmatist sort of a uh, conceptual bias, and de Maestra really does away with that. You know, so is Rene Guillon, but Rene Guillon was, was kind of peculiar. Uh, I, I don't think he was, but I, I don't want to get that whole other can of worms based on some theological sectarian interest. But you know, Demaitre he makes that point um, that uh, politics doesn't politics doesn't really belong to the rational. It doesn't really belong to reason. It, it's not opposed to reason, but it, it partakes of uh, of all aspects of of man's soul. And yes, man is a rational being. Um, that's one of the things that distinguishes him from beasts, but that that it, that is just one aspect that uh, that the human soul partakes of. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with that view, and um, I think that it, it has something to do with uh, with the removal of of friction. Um, you know, I think like the technology really has managed. You know, it's been really successful, almost magically successful, to remove all sorts of. Um, yeah, frictions from human life, you know, and a lot of our dependence on each other has been removed because, you know, now you can access everything much more, um, you know, you don't need to know your baker to get your bread. You don't need to, you know, be on good terms with your family to not, you know, die in, in complete poverty uh, the second day because you've been exiled from the village. So, uh, you know, technology kind of makes that possible. Um, and I feel like a lot of uh, kind of rationalism is, is downstream from that. You know, it's like it's, if, if, this, this is, if this is possible and if this type of friction can be removed, maybe the friction of war can be removed. Maybe the friction of, uh, I don't know, passions can be removed. Everything can be kind of disintermediated like that. Um, I don't believe that's true, but I feel like that's probably the, the, the pitfall that, that, uh, that kind of, uh, plagues the, the rationalist mind. I agree with you. Yeah. I, I want to, before I let you go, cause I know we're coming up on time slowly. Um, I want to ask you the question of the show. There is a question that everyone gets at the end of the show. It's, um, about a subversive thinker. Uh, and I'm sure you, you have quite a, a few of these that is underrated, you know, uh, someone that you you read and, uh, someone that, uh, you know, has influenced you the way you think, but that you think, uh, yeah, people just should read more of. Marcia. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a good Which, one. Uh, you'll find relatable because- yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not just pandering to your own heritage and, and interests. I, I, uh, I, I, not to be macabre, but I mean, I cited Eliade in my, in when I eulogized my, my brother long ago. Um, he, had, he had a pretty active correspondence with uh, with Carl Schmidt and with Rene Guillon. Um, but uh, Schmidt and Guillon are both pretty widely read, especially Schmidt. Rene Eliade is not. He spent his later years at the University of Chicago. He was really hounded uh, by anti-fascist and Zionist organizations in the 70s, only to the fact that he'd been uh, a covenant of Codriano and uh, he served with the Iron Guard. And Leo Strauss, interestingly, came to his defense. Say we went about Strauss. I don't have nice things to say about the late Mr. Strauss, but he had some kind of personal integrity because he said, this man's my friend. It was a war. It, it, was, it was war conditions. You know, you can't, you, you can't judge years subsequent for the crimes of, or the, the evils of history. You know, there's plenty of... Um, Liability to go around if we want to adjudicate such things. Um, but that's that's an interesting fact. Or yeah, Marcia Eliotti. Uh, everybody should read this. Everybody on uh, everybody who considers himself or herself right wing should read the sacred and the profane. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good recommendation. I I have to say I've only come to to Eliade in in my uh, my later years, in my old age, <laughs> because you read him in school in Romania. So he's kind of one of the canonical writers of Romania, and he has some like lightweight uh, fiction, uh, which is kind of like slightly erotic right. fiction about his love affair with an uh, like <laughs> Indian kind of um, esoteric uh, writer. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's quite funny. And and one novel about 
about him being like um, him wearing glasses. <laughs> it's very it's very cute. He had some some entry level stuff as well. I mean, if you're interested in that type of stuff, you know, you're you want the 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 B sides or the the deep cuts. <laughs> There's that as well. <laughs> you no, know, it's fascinating. I, I, yeah, I know he he liked the ladies a lot, and I I can't agree on that. You know, and uh, like I said, Lad Lad and people are very passionate. That's why we love them. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. That school kids in Romania get assigned to Liadi. Like seriously, I had no idea about that. And no, that's that's dope. Yeah, well, there's, there's we don't have that many writers to be honest. So we kind of have to make it make it count. Uh, we have a few poets, a few a few people from from Romania. But yeah, he's he's one of the people that you know is respected internationally, even if he's not as read as uh, as Guinan or or uh, yeah or the Mestre. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, but that's a that's a really good recommendation. He hasn't come up yet on this show, I don't think. But uh, thank you for bringing him up, and also thank you so much for coming on. This has been lovely. Um, I want to point people towards uh, your book, um, Steel Storm, and also your Substack, which is I think uh, relatively new. It's about uh, Substack's about a year old. Okay, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been blowing up in earnest uh, the last six months. But yeah, no, it's people who, who want to uh, can find it at a. Uh, real tom 777.substack.com uh that's where the mind phaser podcast is i uh i drop podcast audio about every, of my own about every two weeks i try to update the long form content on there about twice a month sometimes i update it other times it's as little as once a month but there's a lot of content there as some of my long form print content including the follow-up to my novel steel storm uh, hits the proverbial presses as it's going to in a few weeks here um, I'll have more time to dedicate to the uh, Substack long form. Yeah, it's real Thomas seven 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 dot Substack dot com. You can find me on Twitter at number seven seven seven. You can find me on Gab at real R E A L underscore Thomas T H O M A S seven seven seven. I'm also on Telegram, but you know you can find my Telegram through my Twitter link. That's the best way to do that. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'll I'll put these in the show notes as well. And yeah, please do buy Sealstorm, follow Thomas, subscribe to Substack, uh, and find him on all all the other platforms. Thanks again for coming on, Thomas. <laughs>